On January 18, 1981, two newspaper delivery boys, ages 9 and 14, stumbled upon a female body in Camarillo, California. The body belonged to 20-year-old Rachel Zendejas and was found in a carport. The carport was located just across the street from her apartment, which she shared with her brother and two young daughters, ages 1 and 2. Rachel was a community college student. An autopsy determined that she had been strangled and assaulted. Investigators learned that she had gone out for the evening and hired a couple of babysitters to sit with her daughters. After returning from an evening out, Rachel drove the babysitters home. Officials stated that they believe Rachel's life was taken after she returned and attempted to exit her vehicle. Detectives from the sheriff's office investigated the case until all leads were exhausted and the case became cold. Eleven months after Rachel lost her life, a very similar crime occurred not far away from her home. On the night of December 11, 1981, 21-year-old Lisa Gondek, a retail worker living in Oxnard, California, about 10 miles west of Camarillo, attended a club at the Port Wyanimi Naval Base. After going to a disco together, Lisa's friends dropped her off at her home around 1.30 a.m. At 3 a.m., Lisa's neighbor called law enforcement to report a fire coming from her apartment. After members of the Oxnard Fire Department extinguished the smoldering fires, Lisa's body was discovered in the bathtub. Like Rachel, she too had been strangled and assaulted. The cases were investigated separately from one another until 2002, when a new look at the suspect's DNA from Rachel's crime scene was submitted to the FBI's Combined DNA Index System. The search yielded no results, but in 2004, investigators looking into Lisa's case notified the Ventura County Sheriff's Office announcing they had linked both cases to a single suspect using DNA testing. But once again, unfortunately, the DNA returned no results for a suspect, and the case went cold. In December 2019, Ventura County's Cold Case Unit stepped in and opened a line of inquiry using genetic genealogy the now common practice of identifying possible biological relatives using advanced DNA testing. The investigation provided new leads. Further DNA testing confirmed Tony Garcia of Oxnard was the man responsible for taking the lives of both Rachel Zendejas and Lisa Gondek. 68-year-old Tony Garcia was arrested on February 7, 2023, in Oxnard, California. Sheriff Jim Fryhoff stated that Garcia was born in Roswell, New Mexico, but was enlisted in the U.S. Navy and stationed at Point Mugu near Oxnard. He was discharged in 1980, but remained in the area, where he became a karate student and instructor for many years. The fact is, this suspect has been hiding in plain sight for over 40 years, said Sheriff Freyhoff. Chief Benitez said they identified a number of common denominators between the suspect and the victims, but declined to say what they were. Benitez stated Lisa came to visit Oxnard from Connecticut for a planned two-week trip to visit a friend in the U.S. Navy and ultimately decided to move to Oxnard months before her life was ended. However, it remains unclear if Lisa and Garcia knew one another, and if he was the friend she came to visit. Ventura County District Attorney Eric Nasarenko said, After more than four decades, justice is finally coming to the families of Rachel Zendejas and Lisa Gondek. As this case demonstrates, Charges can be brought at any time, and there is no statute of limitations. We thank the Ventura County Sheriff's Office, the District Attorney's Bureau of Investigation, and the Oxnard Police Department 
for never giving up on finding Rachel and Lisa's slayer. Investigators are looking into the possibility that Garcia might be involved in other crimes and are appealing to the public for help. Anyone with information can contact the Ventura County Sheriff's Office Major Crimes Bureau at 1-805-383-8704 or email their cold case unit at coldcase at ventura Org. On June 27, 1983, sheriff's deputies were called to an unincorporated area of Ronert Park, a medium-sized planned city some 50 miles north of San Francisco, California. A seven-year-old boy stumbled upon a female body behind a real estate office by the corner of Petaluma Hill Road and East Cotati Avenue. When police arrived, they discovered the woman had been fatally beaten with lumber from a stack of wood nearby. Evidentiary items were collected from the crime scene and stored so that it could be used later. Investigators quickly identified the woman as 37-year-old Noelle Russo. She was last seen three days before her body was found on June 24, 1983. According to Noel's friends, she had been fighting with a boyfriend and went to stay with a friend in Santa Rosa, California. That night, the friend drove her to Courthouse Square, where Noel was going to catch a Golden Gate Transit bus back to her apartment in Ronert Park. From there, she disappeared. Detectives began piecing together Noel's life. She had grown up in San Mateo County and in 1962 made local headlines for being named Miss Burlingame. The then 16-year-old told the San Mateo Times that her dream was to become a model and her favorite sport was dancing the twist. I could not have been more surprised, the bubbly teen said. I never in the world thought I would win. I just entered to please mother. A photo that accompanied the article showed Noelle beaming, her arms filled with a bouquet of flowers. In the next two decades, she married and divorced twice and had a son. She had worked for a time as a forest ranger trainee in Colorado. Thereafter, she returned home to the Bay Area, where she was attending Santa Rosa Junior College when her life was taken. She lived in an apartment on Avram Avenue in Ronert Park with her 18-year-old son. She had plans to move to Boys Hot Springs. Noelle loved riding her bike around town. She was known to hitchhike, and friends worried that she was too trusting of strangers. Detectives believed Noelle never boarded a bus back to Ronert Park. It seemed she had encountered someone before it arrived. In the days after the slaying, investigators used a sketch artist to draw Noel in the clothes she was wearing on June 24, 1983, and circulated it in hopes of finding leads. Deputies and detectives collected a significant amount of evidence during the investigation, and numerous interviews were conducted. Detectives developed certain persons of interest over the years, but no arrests were made and the case went cold. The sheriff's office reopened the case in 2010. For the next 12-plus years, detectives began to use DNA analysis technology, submitting several pieces of evidence to the Santa Clara County Crime Lab and the Serological Research Institute. Finally, in a press release, authorities announced that 65-year-old Alfredo Caratero Jr., was arrested on October 2, 2023. He was charged with taking Noel Russo's life. Deputy Rob Dillon said, Russo's family has been notified of the arrest and would appreciate privacy. Caratero Jr. was one of the original persons of interest in the case, the sheriff's office said. He was 25 years old when the crime took place. He was positively identified as the man responsible for what happened to Noel, 
based on DNA and other evidence. Caratero Jr. is detained in the Sonoma County Maine Adult Detention Facility without bail. Deputy Rob Dillon also said, Throughout this investigation, detectives worked closely with the Sonoma County District Attorney's Office. The Sonoma County Sheriff's Office and Sonoma County District Attorney's Office are both dedicated to justice for victims, whether the case is new or old. The VCI unit continues to investigate many cold cases and relentlessly pursue justice for the victims of violent crime. Alfredo Caratero Jr. is currently slated to appear in court on October 18, 2023. It is not known yet if Noel knew him. Investigators are looking at the possibility that he could be one of her ex-boyfriends. Authorities have released little information about Caratero, other than that he has prior convictions in Sonoma County in 1995 and 2001 for possessing stolen property and possessing illegal substances, respectively. Court records also show that he was involved in a domestic violence civil case in September 1985, about two years after Noel lost her life. A woman whose mother was one of Noel's best friends recalled their time together in San Francisco. They kind of liked to bar hop a little bit and just like anybody in the area, have a little bit of fun. And that is what they were doing the night that she went missing. They split up. She said Noel may have been talking to an ex-boyfriend, but she did not think it was him that she went off with. But somehow they got separated at night, and she could not get a hold of her the whole next day. And then they, of course, found her. The resulting discovery and the sadness it brought stuck with her mother for years, she said, enough so that her mother kept a journal and often wrote about her slain friend. I think her eyes twinkled when she looked at her. She was just a beautiful person, and that is one thing that shined through in my mom's writing that this was somebody she really cared about, and it just devastated her that she lost her. Twenty-year-old Krista Martin lived in Wichita, Kansas. She lived alone in an apartment on South Osage Street. It was a place she had just recently moved into in the fall of 1989. On October 1st, Krista was reported missing after family members were unable to contact her. The next day, on October 2nd, police went to Krista's apartment to see if she was there. Inside the apartment, they found Krista's body. She suffered blunt force trauma to the back left side of the head. She had also been assaulted. Investigators could not find the weapon that was used, but did collect DNA evidence from the crime scene. It was noted that there were no signs of forced entry. At the time, DNA testing and CODIS systems were not available. Nonetheless, the DNA evidence was carefully preserved. In their investigation, police noted that there was a domestic disturbance call that went out in the vicinity of Krista's home a week before her life was taken. Officers were unable to confirm if this incident had any connection with Krista's case. Between 1990 and 1992, the case detective sent evidence to the FBI crime lab in hopes of identifying a suspect, but unfortunately, this effort yielded no results, leaving the case unsolved. In 2009, DNA evidence was submitted to the Sedgwick County Regional Forensic Science Center, which resulted in a potential suspect profile, but there were no matches in the CODIS database. In 2020, the Wichita Police Department, leveraging advanced technology, again sought the assistance of the FBI to reevaluate the DNA evidence collected in 1989. The police department teamed with Othram to determine if advanced DNA testing could help to identify the person responsible. The forensic evidence was then sent to Othram's laboratory in The Woodlands, Texas, for advanced DNA testing. 
Othram scientists developed a comprehensive DNA profile for the unknown perpetrator. After successfully completing the process, the DNA profile was delivered to the FBI's Forensic Genetic Genealogy Team, and the FBI team performed the necessary work to generate new investigative leads. In 2021, a team consisting of a Wichita Police cold case detective and an FBI special agent embarked on a journey to Alabama and Arkansas, collaborating with additional federal agents working in Maryland. Their mission was to conduct extensive interviews and gather additional evidence to break the case. Finally, in April 2023, a possible suspect, Paul Hart, was identified. Frustratingly, it was discovered that Hart lost his life in a car crash in Memphis, Tennessee in March of 1999. In June of 2023, the Wichita Police Department detective and FBI special agent traveled to Arkansas, where they collected additional DNA samples from direct relatives of Paul Hart for further analysis. Through additional testing, investigators confirmed that Paul Hart was responsible for taking Krista's life. A press conference was held on October 2, 2023, to announce the update in the 34-year-old cold case. In fact, the announcement came exactly 34 years after Krista's body was discovered to the day. Detective Adam Vandermolen, the lead detective working Krista Martin's case, said the Wichita Police Department never forgot Krista. It is just after the initial investigation, investigators had nothing else to go off of and that is when they looked at this case through another lens. For investigators to think in 89, we should probably do a DNA collection kit on her because maybe something will happen. Had they not done that in 89, we would not be looking at this at this point in time because that technology was not a thing back then, but it is now. I think it is evident that she was remembered on multiple occasions, in 89, 09, and 2020, Vandermolen said. Sometime in the spring of 2023, we honed in on a family through genetic genealogy, the Hart family. No ties to Wichita, not from Wichita at all, not really from the Midwest. They are from the great state of Arkansas. So I said, how does this tie into Wichita? These people are not from here. What is the story there? So we started digging into that family. And as we dug into that family, we found an individual who lived in Wichita in 1989 and shortly after the slaying of Krista Martin in October 1989. This individual up and left Wichita and went back to Arkansas. No one knew about him. We have asked Krista's family. Does this name ring a bell? No. Asked the original investigators. Went through the case file of the people they talked to and the neighborhood. This individual's name never came up in any of the investigations from 89 up until the present. He lived around the corner from Krista Martin's house, and it is six houses from Krista Martin's house where her life was taken. Vandermolen added that if it had been someone in Krista's circle of friends, he believed that the information would have been known much sooner. But since it was potentially such a stranger to her, investigators did not know who exactly they were looking for. It gives me goosebumps because it was there. We just did not know about it until a couple of months ago. They were about the same age range and by all accounts that I've been able to track down had no ties to one another. Just a chance encounter? I do not know. It is an answer that we will probably never know. What we did learn was that Krista was a very outgoing individual that frequented local drinking establishments and befriended people she encountered. It was not uncommon for Krista to get rides home from people she had recently met and invited them to her apartment. 
Vandermolen said that he hopes this case shows the department will work on cases until they cannot any longer. Sedgwick County's District Attorney, Mark Bennett, also spoke at the press conference. He said that when Wichita police presented the facts of the case to him, it was determined that charges would be filed if Paul Hart were alive today. As he is not, the case is now considered solved. Law enforcement made me aware they were working on this case, and when they reached as far as they could and came to all the conclusions that they could reach, with the assistance of the Forensic Science Center, they presented it to me as they would any other case. After listening to all the evidence presented and the information gathered and the conclusions that they were able to make using the DNA, it is clear to me that this is a case that I would have charged if the suspect was alive to charge him. This is a completed investigation. This is a cleared investigation. Also at the press conference, Ember Moore, Krista Martin's niece, thanked investigators and volunteers for their dedication in solving the case. I am glad we can finally move forward and have peace knowing that the perpetrator is not walking around free or amongst us, she said. Again, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to everyone involved in bringing justice to Krista's case. She deserved so much more out of this life than what she ended up with. Nine-year-old Debbie Lynn Randall lived in Cobb County, Georgia in 1972. Her parents were John and Juanita Randall. She also had an older brother named Melvin. Late at night on January 13th, Debbie was walking home from a laundromat across the street. She never made it back home. 4,000 people started looking for her. It included Marietta civil defense workers, a local radio group, the Concerned Citizens Committee, and students from the nearby college who had heard the news and wanted to help in any way they could. Her body was found 16 days later near an intersection of Windy Hill and Powers Ferry Road. Her body was found by a college student who had voluntarily joined the search effort. An autopsy determined that she had been strangled and assaulted. Crucial pieces of evidence, namely a hair and a piece of cloth with a flowery design, were stored by investigators. Two young locals told authorities that they saw a dark pickup truck backed up in a parking lot near Debbie's house that drove away quickly. All that was left in the parking lot was laundry detergent. Investigators diligently followed up on all of the leads, but came no closer to identifying a suspect. The case eventually went cold. A 2001 test that the FBI conducted on the hair that was found at the crime scene narrowed the pool of possible suspects significantly. The piece of cloth was sent to a lab in 2015, and thanks to DNA testing, resulted in a DNA profile of an unknown man. DNA testing carried out in 2019, made possible by extra funding, and a reanalysis of the cloth in 2022 brought investigators even closer to answers. Further DNA testing in 2022 then brought investigators into touch with people who were probably related to the perpetrator. Those relatives supplied DNA samples to assist authorities. More testing was done, and in 2023, brought up William B. Rose, who was 24 years old back in 1972 and lived in the same apartment complex where Debbie's family lived. Rose took his own life two years after he ended Debbie's life. Investigators made the announcement in September 2023 that Rose is the man responsible. Cobb County District Attorney Flynn Brody said, it may take us some time, but with the new technologies that are coming out every day, we are going to do everything we can to solve our cold cases, to make sure we bring people to justice. 
The answer we are providing today will not bring her back. We cannot extract justice from the perpetrator, but I know he must answer to a higher power. Ron Alter, a cold case investigator with the district attorney's office, said Rose had previous arrests for alcohol-related incidents and possibly took his own life due to fear of being caught by the police at the time, even though he was not a suspect. If he drove by, I'm sure he saw her. I believe that was a crime of opportunity. He saw her by herself and abducted her, Alter said. The investigator confirmed investigators used ancestry websites to find familial matches to Rose from distant relatives and narrowed their suspect list from there. Debbie's brother Melvin Randall also spoke at the press conference. I learned over the years that it does you no good to hate or hold grudges. Melvin is the only family member alive who heard the news. Debbie's mom passed away in 2018, while her father passed away in 2022. I would like to say that I wish my mother was here, but I know she knows in heaven now that it is finally over, and we just want to say we thank all of you for what you have done to make this day come to pass, Melvin said. After a while, I blamed myself for it, because I was her big brother, and I battled with it for a while, but then I realized that there was nothing I could have done, and it just happened, and it was not my fault. I'm just grateful for the community. It is a relief that it was no one that we knew, and it was just great that it is over. It has weighed heavy on us for a long time. Despite the losses he has endured and the painful circumstances around all of them, Melvin Randall said he was not angry with either Rose or his family. I know they are struggling, going through this too. It was tough for us, and I am sure it is just as tough for them. I wish all of them well, and God bless them, and I do not have any animosity toward them. Morris Nix, a retired detective with the Cobb County Sheriff's Office who worked the case, said... Technology does not get old, it does not retire, it does not get sick, and it does not quit. Technology was seeking William Rose, and it found him in the grave. 38-year-old Domitia Alvarez was found stabbed multiple times in the office of her family's auto repair shop on B Street in West Houston, on April 24, 2009, she succumbed to her injuries at the scene. Investigators from the Houston Police Department were able to collect DNA evidence, but had no other leads and the case went cold. In 2021, the Police Department's Cold Case Squad re-examined the evidence in the case as part of a case review project. They identified Jorge Trevino Cardenas, through DNA evidence and found additional information implicating him in the case. 50-year-old Cardenas was charged with taking Domatia's life on January 26, 2023. Authorities said he is currently serving a sentence for an unrelated crime. Investigators did not reveal a possible motive and also did not say if Domatia and Cardenas knew each other. Anyone with additional information in this case is urged to contact the Houston Police Department at 713-308-3600 or Crime Stoppers at 713-222-TIPS. <laughs>